Okay, now I will start uh, properly. Again, I'm Jonathan Zeitlin. I'm the academic director of the Amsterdam Center for European Studies, which is organizing uh, this conference on differentiated integration in the European Union. We're doing this uh, in collaboration with Free Horizon 2020 projects funded by the European Commission, which are uh, linked together uh, in a network uh, called uh, Differentiation Clustering uh, Excellence uh, or DICE. Uh, the format of the, uh, the, the conference is there are three uh, panels, uh, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, one in the evening. Uh, today and tomorrow we'll be exploring uh, the uh, promises but also the pitfalls of differentiated integration uh, understood as rules uh, and policies that apply to some EU member states and not others, uh, but may also apply uh, to countries uh, outside the EU who participate uh, externally. Uh, we will be looking at a range of different issues in separate panels, including uh, Brexit and the uh, implications of differentiated integration for the future of the EU. Uh, in this panel this morning, uh, we start uh, looking at uh, competing theoretical approaches to understanding differentiation and uh, the empirical evidence in support for them. We have three uh, very distinguished uh, panelists, um, and let me uh, introduce them before I give them uh, the floor. So the first speaker will be uh, Frank Schimmelfenig. He's a, uh, a professor of European politics at ETH Zurich together with uh, Bridget Lafont, who will also be speaking in sub subsequent panels. Uh, he's the scientific uh, coordinator of the Horizon 2020 project, Integrating uh, Diversity in the European Union uh, or uh, INDIV uh, EU. And you'll hear more about his very extensive research and publications on differentiated integration in a moment. Our second speaker is uh, Sandra Lavene. Uh, she is Professor of European and International Politics at the University of Geneva, and she is a visiting professor at the, uh, the College of Europe. She's one of the leaders of the project um, EU Integration and Differentiation for Effectiveness and Accountability, or EU uh, IDEA. And our third speaker is uh, John Eric Fossen. He's professor of political science at the Arena Center for European uh, Studies at the University of Oslo. Uh, and he's also the scientific uh, coordinator of the third uh, Horizon 2020 project, EU Differentiation, Dominance and Democracy, or EU 3D. So here's the format uh, of this morning's uh, panel. Uh, each of the speakers, in the order I mentioned uh, to the, mentioned them, uh, will have 15 minutes to present uh, their take on differentiated integration uh, in the EU. Then I'll pose uh, a few questions to them and give them a chance uh, each to respond for about uh, three minutes. Um, also commenting on each other's presentations if they like. And then we'll turn to questions and answers with you, the audience. And so uh, what I ask you to do as the audience is to write your questions in the, uh, the Q&A window. My uh, colleague uh, Maria Weimer from the University of Amsterdam uh, will help to uh, process and funnel uh, the questions and I'll present them either individually uh, or in batches uh, to the speakers. So without further ado, let me turn to Frank Schimmelfenig and Frank, uh, please uh, share your screen. We have, you have 15 minutes and I'll uh, signal to you uh, through the window and through the chat uh, as you get towards the end. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to speak and good morning everyone. So as um, Jonathan said, uh, our task this morning in this first panel is to present different theoretical 
approaches to studying differentiated integration in the European Union and the approach that I will present is an intergovernmentalist uh, take on uh, explaining differentiated integration. So let me just see. Sorry. Um, so just to uh, briefly uh, recapitulate and, and, and I guess for for most students of inter uh, European integration, intergovernmentalism doesn't need much of an uh, introduction, uh, but just to uh, uh, get us on the same page, uh, intergovernmentalism is an, is an actor-centric approach to studying European integration and it's uh, based on some kind of uh, soft rationalism, assuming bounded rationality of the actors and uh, the main actors in question are states or more precisely governments uh, that um, uh, shape and drive and also uh, limit um, European integration. So uh, according to intergovernmentalism, it's uh, uh, the constellation of government's preferences, uh, their interdependence amongst each other and their power um, that shapes the substantive and institutional outcomes of European integration. And it does so in intergovernmental negotiations. So uh, progress in integration, more integration, depends um, on convergent and interdependent uh, governmental preferences. Uh, you, can, you can only have that if there is sufficient convergence and if governments are sufficiently interdependent uh, to uh, be able to uh, be on um, further integration. And that already brings us to uh, the main factor that uh, drives differentiated integration, uh, that limits uh, the um, possibility of uniform integration and, and, and this is uh, a situation in which uh, the preferences of the states concerned and or their capacity are too heterogeneous to achieve uniform integration. So that's uh, uh, the, the basic intergovernmentalist take on differentiated integration. So um, uh, governments uh, will go for differentiated integration if uniform integration is not possible, but they still see value in moving ahead with integration in smaller groups. So here's an, uh, just a table that shows the different constellations. So as I said, uniform integration requires actually uh, uh, the coming together of common preferences, mutual dependence and uh, sufficient common capacity to implement whatever governments uh, are able to uh, agree on if um, member states' uh, preferences are, are conflicting overall, if there's no uh, interdependence between them or if they are just not able uh, to implement, uh, then there will be no integration. But if there is heterogeneity, um, either of preferences or of interdependence or of capacity that uh, opens up space for differentiated integration where not everybody has to come on board but uh, those states that um, uh, have sufficient commonality of preferences and are um, more interdependent than, than others or have the, the uh, requisite capacities uh, can, can agree on um, integration while uh, either uh, letting other states, for instance, states that have uh, different preferences opt out, or also by ex ex excluding states, for instance, those states that they uh, think do not have the requisite capacity uh, to join in the integration scheme. Now, uh, that brings up the question, what is the relevant heterogeneity uh, that has driven uh, differentiated integration in the European Union. And I say the uh, uh, simplest statement I can, I can offer is uh, that it has mainly been heterogeneity of wealth. Uh, 
among the member states and between member states and non-member states. And this is a shortcut because uh, uh, wealth is correlated with lots of other things. Uh, wealth is correlated with state capacity. Wealthier countries are uh, better able to implement demanding integrated policies. Um, wealth has to do with dependence. Uh, wealthier states are less dependent on the uh, cooperation integration with other countries. Poorer states are more dependent. And it has to do with good governance. Um, wealthier states are uh, by and large better governed uh, than uh, poorer states. And, and all of that matters uh, for uh, differentiated integration decisions. So uh, the main heterogeneity in the European Union that drives uh, differentiated integration pits rich countries, high capacity, well-governed countries against poor countries who have worse state capacity and who are less well governed. So how does, how does it play out for rich and poor, poor states? So um, first of all, if you look at non-member states, richer states are more reluctant to join the European Union um, because they have less reason to give up autonomy and are less concerned about uh, sharing their wealth. Uh, among the member states, richer states are uh, reluctant to deepen uh, beyond market integration, mainly for the same reasons. And uh, rich member states in the European Union are also um, reluctant to admit poorer candidate states, uh, again, for the same reasons. Uh, so what, what enhances the bargaining power of rich states is that they are actually quite happy where they are. Uh, they are close to the status quo. Uh, and uh, this closeness to the status quo in um, European Union decision gives them the bargaining power to prevent far-reaching uniform integration. Because they are so close to the status quo, they can say stop whenever integration proposals go too far beyond uh, their own interests and would require them to give up too much of autonomy and to spend too much into a common budget. So um, non -member, rich non-member states are happy to settle for market integration without membership, and that gives rise to external differentiation. Norway, Switzerland are uh, cases in point. Or uh, richer member states uh, opt out of supranational integration of core state powers whenever uh, that impinges too much on their uh, autonomy and um, uh, spending contributions transfers to the European Union. And that has, in the course of the history of the EU, given rise to internal differentiation. Uh, Denmark, Sweden, uh, the UK are cases in point here. On the other hand, poorer states, uh, for the reasons I mentioned, are quite eager to join the uh, European Union, and they are also eager to deepen integration uh, because uh, they uh, hope for um, 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 becoming um, wealthier, which is which is true. Uh, actually, uh, Im Im improving state capacity and in, and improving governance through more integration. That, but I mean, this this eagerness uh, to integrate also uh, moves them quite far away from the status quo. And uh, uh, the Negotiating theory tells us that those actors that are far away from the status quo are also willing to, to, to accept um, uh, outcomes um, uh, as long as they improve their situation, even if they are not, uh, um, if they don't really come close uh, to their ideal point. So uh, that makes, that uh, reduces the bargaining power of poorer states in uh, uh, integration negotiation and makes them willing to, uh, to accept differentiated integration, even if it discriminates against them. So as non-member states, as candidates, uh, they are happy to settle for association agreements as long as they are a stepping stone towards eventual membership, that gives rise to external differentiation, and they are uh, 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 willing to accept at least a temporary exclusion from full membership when they when they join. Yeah? So uh, the enlargement of the European Union typically gives rise to uh, internal differentiation uh, for uh, at least a couple of years. 
there are further considerations we have to uh, uh, look at, and this is size and ex externalities. Again, from a uh, from a rational institutionalist perspective that intergovernmentalism subscribes to. What is the size of inside and outside? Uh, at least for the insiders, so those countries that move ahead with integration, there needs to be a critical mass for um, differentiated integration to become viable. Yeah? And that has to do with scale effect and transaction cost. It only makes sense for uh, uh, groups of countries to move ahead uh, differentially um, if uh, that still uh, promises uh, sufficient benefits. Um, and that usually requires that you have, uh, um, it's not just one, two or three states that move ahead, but it's actually a large group. So uh, what we see actually in differentiated integration is that the vanguard group, those that move ahead, is usually a large group. And they are also open uh, uh, to the inclusion of further countries once they meet the prerequisites. Um, and then uh, it also requires that the, uh, the outsider group uh, that the outsider position remains su sustainable for those countries that do not want to join. And, uh, but that has mainly to do uh, with potential negative externalities that differentiated integration has on those countries that are left out. And uh, that brings me to the second condition, externalities, uh, that is important for uh, uh, whether um, um, differentiated integration comes about and is um, viable and that actually goes goes back to uh, some early work uh, by Alcuin uh, Koenigar who has has focused on these externalities as, as a major condition of differentiated integration so uh, for differentiated integration to be to be stable and to come about these externalities actually need to be low uh, because if you have positive externalities for outsiders yeah so those that stay out benefit from whatever policies uh, the insiders produce, that not only makes uh, remaining outside a, uh, uh, um, a very comfortable position, but it also raises interest among the insiders to leave the insider group if you can have the benefits outside without con uh, contributing uh, to the common good. Uh, so that's a free rider cherry picking um, position. And, and that's why uh, whenever you have differentiated integration, this cherry picking comes up as a as a, a point in discussion and as a limiting condition. On the other hand, if uh, differentiated integration is organized in a way that it creates negative externalities for the outsiders, so those that remain outside um, actually uh, uh, suffer uh, uh, from the policies that the insiders produce, that then creates centripetal effects. So these countries really want to join um, and make integration uniform, and that also undermines differentiated integration in the in the long term. Um, so that that also means that that not all heterogeneities that you have in the European Union will actually lead to differentiated integration. If 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 all heterogeneities that we see would would lead to the I, we would see a lot more than than we actually see. So whenever and you have externalities, and that is the case when you, when you talk about um, burden sharing or redistribution, um, that means um, uh, then uh, uh, differentiated integration is unlikely to come about uh, because it creates uh, these externalities. And if you just look at the recent discussions about the European Union's migration policy, uh, when there's a discussion about who takes in how many refugees from uh, uh, Greece, there's always this concern. Yeah, if if uh, not everyone participates, then there will be free riding, and that limits the um, the willingness of everyone uh, uh, to move in the direction of differentiated integration in these areas. So uh, let me just now um, move on to. Uh, um, uh, just some empirical illustrations, and I don't have much time to do that, so I'll quickly run through them. So, um, in line uh, with the hypothesis I uh, proposed, here are some results uh, from our um, empirical research. So, the uh, the first graph on the on the uh, uh, left hand side uh, of this slide um, shows uh, that. Um, when the EU has negotiated reform treaties yeah, from 
the single European Act to Lisbon, um, the probability of a country of uh, getting an opt-out, uh, getting a differentiation, uh, is in, in increasing with its wealth. Yeah? This is what the, what the graph shows. You also see that uh, the baseline probability of differentiated integration is not very high, uh, but uh, within this low baseline, richer countries are more differentiated than poorer countries. Turning to accession treaties, it's the other way around, because here the EU has typically uh, included uh, poorer countries in the, in the past decades. Yeah? So uh, as countries uh, become richer, they actually have lesser, uh, less, um, uh, fewer opt-outs, uh, fewer uh, differences. Poorer states uh, have a higher probability of being excluded as a result of their accession treaties. And the, and the last panel, um, uh, then uh, uses a combined measure because the idea behind wealth and the I really is a, a, a curvilinear relationship, um, meaning that uh, the higher the heterogeneity of wealth, so the higher a country is away from the average wealth of the European Union member states, the more likely it will have um, differentiations. And uh, this is what the last panel shows. Uh, so this is the deviation uh, uh, from uh, from the average, as countries uh, deviate more from the average, they have a higher probability of um, differentiation. So, um, in the interest of time, I'll skip that, uh, which is just an extension of that, uh, also leading, uh, also including non-member states, uh, and just finish here and uh, um, allow me a little bit of marketing for what I have presented. Um, uh, results uh, that I've worked on together with uh, Thomas Vinson. We've just uh, uh, published a book uh, where you find both the theoretical and the empirical findings uh, published with Oxford University Press and see some other references uh, that I've drawn my remarks from. Thank you very much for listening and um, happy to go back to Jonathan now. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Frank. Uh, Thanks. Um, can people hear me? Um, thanks uh, very much for the presentation, for sticking to time. And I just want to uh, um, underline the reinforce your your marketing point that uh, people who want to see this uh, very bare bones uh, analysis fleshed out should look at uh, the very uh, exciting and impressive. Uh, new book that uh, Frank has published uh, with uh, uh, with Thomas Winson, and now I want to turn for a, a different take on differentiation in the EU to Sandra Lavene. So Sandra, uh, the floor is yours. Please share your screen, and we look forward to your presentation. Yes, um, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I will. Put this into this mode. So I would like to start um, my presentation and in introducing, let's say, my take on the study of differentiated integration through a vision, a vision that uh, has been formulated by Philipp Schmitter uh, of a condominio as an alternative view on uh, the polity uh, constituting European integration. And this is a vision that takes us away from intergovernmental grant bargains between, you know, more or less unitary states. And it also takes us away from a vision of the EU as a polity striving towards federalism, towards a hierarchical centralized structure that has more and more in common with uh, a state. So this vision of a condominio stresses uh, the fragmentation uh, of the European system and the fact that it is very much also organized um, along sectoral regimes um, that have their own features. Um, and the sectoral regimes, in fact, um, may have their own potential uh, for constituting differentiated integration that is worth studying um, for itself. So my aim is to shed light uh, on this structure of secondary institutionalization, if you want, within the European system 
and uh, what it can provide for in terms of differentiated integration. So I will not talk about EU central institutions, the Council, the Parliament, the Commission and the Court so much, but I will focus on uh, sectoral organizations that are set up in specific policy fields. This includes regulatory agencies, um, committees, it can also include networks of other public actors uh, of sub-national nature, um, also non-executive actors. Um, let me be clear, um, this is not to say that uh, the EU central institutions are completely taken out of the observation. It is crucial to analyze the interplay between sectoral secondary institutions and EU central uh, decision-making bodies. Um, however, uh, I will stress now this, uh, this uh, secondary layer of institutionalization. Um, the definition of differentiated integration that we use in the EU IDEA uh, project within which uh, I, I collaborate is broader um, than the one uh, used by the INDIF uh, project, uh, which uh, Frank leads as far as I have read uh, your um, documentation so far. Um, the INDIF project focuses very much on bind binding formal EU rules to which states agree to adhere. So binding formal EU rules. Um, we also look at uh, you know, um, the legal nature of uh, EU rules in a more uh, continuum perspective that looks at different degrees of legalization and the flexibility inherent to EU rules, also going down to soft law. Uh, and we look at uh, cooperation also in organizational terms that is um, in which bodies do states participate, which uh, actors um, within states do constitute these bodies and with what, which powers, which possibility do they have to contribute um, to the organizational setup within which EU rules are being developed. Um, this broader definition of differentiated integration together with the focus on the condominial features of the EU, um, I would argue opens uh, the perspective for forms of differentiated integration that are not domination by definition and we will hear more about domination by, uh, um, in the next presentation. But I would say that the conventional view uh, focusing only on EU binding law being um, the boundary that moves in a differentiated manner to uh, member states or also uh, external states, um, this focus on the EU regulatory boundary uh, in a non-differentiated manner and not looking at the organizational dimension necessarily leads to a form of domination whereby the uh, countries have to take it or leave it basically. Um, if you take this condominium view and you um, account for the various degrees of legalization and openness and flexibility uh, of EU rules and uh, include also the organizational dimension that is the focus on all those bodies that participate in the development, um, the, the specification of EU law or the implementation and the enforcement. Um, and you look which countries, which representatives uh, sit in these bodies, which what, with what uh, competences, um, then uh, you may discover forms of differentiated integration that are less uh, predominantly uh, marked by domination. At least uh, this would be um, the hypothesis and then it has to be tested in the different uh, policy areas. So the theoretical prism uh, behind this approach is a combination of uh, multi-level governance approaches and functionalism. Um, this idea of the EU as a multi-level governance system has been developed uh, in a masterful manner by Liz Petoge and Gary Marx where they stress that there are these type one central um, institutions in the EU system that are hierarchically ordered, uh, politically encom encompassing, um, 
and also territorially defined. But next to these type one institutions, the EU is a case where type two institutions are particularly prominent um, in comparison to other political systems. And these type two institutions are sector specific or task specific. They are more organized along functional boundaries than along territorial boundaries. Um, they are horizontal um, and rather than hierarchical. This means that they are composed as hubs of um, regulators and representatives uh, from the participating countries. Um, second, uh, we, we need also some extent of sensibility for the flexibility of law uh, to, to measure the degree of legalization and, and the opportunities that this leaves for those bodies, those type two bodies, and to, to specify and, and uh, yeah, put, put, put uh, regulations into concrete um, prescriptions. And uh, we study then um, the interplay between the organizational scope for participation and the regulatory dimension in differentiated integration. And the question is then, what scope of differentiated integration is there at the level of sectoral regimes and institutions? And does it allow for differentiated integration without domination? Uh, under what conditions? And how democratic can this be? Um, if you are wondering why I stress these secondary institutions uh, in the EU system, these type two institutions, um, it is true the EU has gone through a, a process of politicization, it is still very much in it. It has become more part, uh, political, it has become more centralized, in some respects also more supranational. Um, but at the same time as the EU has gone through these steps of centralization and politicization, it has also intensified delegation uh, to these type two bodies and uh, regulatory agencies are one typical case for such bodies, which is also quite um, uh, good to study empirically. Uh, you see over the last 20 years, we have had a real proliferation. Today we have uh, 36. EU agencies, and they are not only in very technical fields, we have uh, many agencies in the fields of justice and home affairs, also in foreign and security policy or in the area of financial supervision. Um, secondly, we have studied this um, yeah, for, for some years and we have seen that um, we, uh, these bodies are relatively flexible for the inclusion of non-member states which are associated to the EU um, by, by, by treaties, be it the uh, European Economic Area, the bilateral treaties with Switzerland, or um, also the, the neighborhood policy. Le legal regimes in terms of degrees of legalization characterizing different policy areas um, and also organizational uh, bodies that uh, have this potential for participation. Um, we have looked at this across four types of uh, macro institutional association, if you want, and uh, five policy areas. And an important finding is that we found more differentiation in terms of the legal and the organizational uh, patterns of differentiated integration at the level of the sectors than at the level of the macro institutional arrangement of association and this preeminence of sectoral modes of differentiated integrations in fact corroborates this picture of a condominio in, uh, in differentiated integration. Finally, um, for those who follow Brexit will have seen that the UK, uh, yes, uh, government wanted to, to leave the European Union, but it has stressed its willingness to uh, adhere to EU agencies as well as um, information networks and um, EU programs and other uh, networks of regulators um, where this is seen as, as necessary and conducive to market integration, the economic partnership, but also in the field of security um, and in other areas including energy or, or, or uh, education. 
So um, I would say uh, this layer of, of secondary institutions uh, and um, sectoral regimes is, is there to stay. It will not be uh, necessarily um, more integrated into the vertical type one system, but actually we might also see uh, the evolution in the other direction, having more fragmentation over the time uh, if we consider both the internal and the external pressure on the European Union, uh, yeah, including its internal politicization and challenges. Um, for the EU IDEA project, we have uh, then devised a an analytical framework to, to, to study this that looks at the regulatory dimension, as I said, accounting for different degrees of legalization um, and types of uh, legal commitment under EU law. Does it imply approximation or harmonization? Um, and how much scope is there for flexibility and adaptation? And the organizational dimension, looking at the secondary bodies that are sector specific and analyzing the scope of participation along the policy making cycle. Um, we also defined a number of hypotheses that are sort of hidden in, in, in this uh, scheme on the bottom of the slide. Um, it, it is not incompatible with intergovernmentalism in so far that we also uh, look at the role of domestic regulatory capacity that is linked to wealth. Um, and we also include the issue of externalities that are linked to issue characteristics for motivating um, interests for joining a sectoral regime. But what is important is that we distinguish uh, this regulatory and organizational dimension. And from uh, this, um, we then uh, draw, uh, or we draw um, results with regard to the effectiveness and the legitimacy of uh, these arrangements. Um, yeah, I have not much time to present results and the research is of course ongoing, but I would like to show you a snapshot uh, for six regulatory agencies that we have analyzed with regard to their degree of openness uh, for third country participation. Um, these are regulatory agencies in the field of the single market, uh, but also finance uh, regulation and justice and home affairs. We have uh, on the top the Aviation Safety Agency, um, the Securities Market Authority, um, and the Frontex uh, on the right. And on the bottom, we have the Chemicals Agency, the Data Protection Board, and the Center for Disease Prevention and Control. And in these spiders, we have coded uh, the agency's regulations as well as their international agreements with regard to these regulatory and organizational dimensions that I was stressing before. So um, under closure, we look at the number of agreements with third countries, the scope of the acquis covered, um, the legal quality of these obligations, um, and also the depth of participation in the organizational structures along um, this policy, policy cycle idea. Then we have um, a dimension of control that looks at the link between the agency and its scope for external differentiation um, with um, what I would call type one institutions. Uh, in this um, regard, it's mainly the commission, sometimes it's also the parliament, sometimes also um, the Council. Um, here we look at whether these EU central institutions um, need to authorize uh, the conduct of external agreements uh, by the agency. So authorization and the second dimension is instruction. How much prescription is there from the EU central bodies to the agency and its management board how to conduct these external relations. And finally, we look at congruence, which is um, the question how congruent are the external patterns of differentiation with EU overall um, political priorities with regard to third countries. Um, perhaps it's a bit uh, um, unexpected. Uh, we have this uh, scale from zero to two, and the higher the numbers, the fuller the spider, um, the closer, more closed, uh, the more, the less differentiated the agency is, and the emptier the cells, the more differentiation we have. 
right? This is important. <laughs> the, the higher the number, the cl more closure, um, and the lower, the, the emptier the cells, the more differentiation we have. So, um, we, if we look at the top uh, three agencies, we see they are also the more open ones, the more flexible or differentiated ones. Um, this is perhaps surprising because two of them are in highly politicized fields, uh, the ESMA uh, in finance and, and Frontex. Um, and they have become more open over time. This is also interesting because these three agencies have had reforms and um, with each uh, reform, uh, actually, um, the openness has increased in terms of um, numbers of agreements, but also scope um, and uh, depth for some of them. But uh, what has um, inc uh, increased in the other direction, reducing uh, flexibility, if you want, is control. Um, at the same time as they have become more open for uh, cooperation with third countries, uh, these three agencies have also become more controlled um, in terms of uh, authorization for, um, for, for the EASA and uh, also for Frontex, and in terms from, of instructions in the case of um, ESMA. Well, um, so this is the this is first important finding. Um, openness has, has increased and uh, also in quality, not only in, in number. And we could go into details. I want to emphasize uh, in re regard to, to possibility of uh, participation in, in the dimension of depth uh, of the association. Um, systematically, um, it is not the idea that third countries are part of the management board of, of these agencies. Uh, mostly the agreements do not foresee that the third countries are part of the management board. This is only the case for the EEA countries, which have systematically access to EU regulatory agencies. Um, but um, more countries are admitted to the management board as observers. Um, the rule is that they have no voting rights, so we could say this is domination but we have also exclusions or exceptions here. Um, for instance, uh, Switzerland and uh, the EEA countries have limited voting rights in the management board of Frontex. Um, yes, and uh, more generally, voting is not so much the practice. We have done interviews with uh, representatives in these bodies and they have confirmed, uh, normally they try to find agreement by consensus and voting is not the rule, so this shadow of uh, domination is there in formal terms if they don't have uh, voting rights, but it is limited and many decisions are taken also at the technical level uh, by collaboration. And to, I would like to focus a little bit more on one area, which is aviation, uh, so EASA um, and, and the corresponding external treaties. Perhaps aviation is a particularly differentiated field. Um, it is also technocratic, but it's not fully atypical. It's, it's just, I think, good as an illustration. Um, and when you try to draw the different regimes um, associating third countries to EU aviation safety um, regulations. Sandra, can I ask you to wind up? You're running seriously over time. Oh, sorry, yeah. Well, uh, you, you get this picture of concentric, uh, or not concentric, of, of, of regime complexity, I would like to say. Concentric, yes, because you have the EASA and the EU regulations at the center. But each of these um, differentiation circles is guided by different degrees of legalization and different possibilities for organizational inclusion. The European Common Aviation Area foresees direct effect of EU rules and has the last instance of the Court of Justice. Um, the members of this area are mostly represented on the management board. With the US, Canada, uh, Brazil, China and Japan, there are comprehensive bilateral agreements. This is the circle to the left. Interestingly, with Brazil, US, and Canada, there are also far-reaching common institutions, common boards, a uh, certification management team, a bilateral oversight board. Um, and if you look at the regulations of EASA uh, or the directives, you will see that they even include US and Canada 
Canadian directives as part of the Aki of aviation safety. So obviously there is a possibility for participation here. Uh, and there are 125 uh, other working arrangements with their own possibilities of participation, which are more limited, uh, but also the regulatory dimension is weaker and more focused on information exchange and city building. Um, and finally, we also looked at international organizations that are pertinent in this field because also this matters then for the question of differentiated integration in regulatory and organizational terms if there are other international organizations where these teams participate. To conclude, um, if we look at the sectoral regimes, we see uh, a differentiated picture of differentiated integration and more scope. Uh, for possibilities of participation and flexibilities then um, is hitherto acknowledged, I would say, in, 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 in the literature. Um, there are a number of caveats, caveats we need to account for the shadow of hierarchy. We have to look at uh, how much is predetermined, how much is really flexible, uh, and what is the role, for example, of the Court of Justice. Um, we need to identify trade-offs between higher degrees of legalization and um, softer modes of policy making without legislating, as, as Adrienne Heritier has put it. Um, it may take us maybe in the wrong direction if we trust too much into these forms of coordination or experimentalism, if I want to make a bridge to the panel tomorrow by Jonathan Seitlin. And of course, democratic control. But here I would like to stress we have the domestic uh, states, yeah, which, which remain in place and that have also a role to play in holding these regulators and bodies accountable um, that are represented in EU institutions. Um, I think uh, this uh, condominium picture is more compatible with what Fabrini has called the more economic European Union that would be decoupled from a more political union because it is based on more intergovernmentalism, on transgovernmentalism and less a federal political unification. Uh, yes, and, and this is out for the future evolution of the EU. So I close here. Thank you. Jonathan, it seems that Jonathan is struggling. Thank you, Sandra. Oh. Um, can you stop sharing your screen? Can people hear me? So, um, okay. We should uh, move now to the, uh, the third speaker. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I will um, share the screen. Ah, this was wrong. Um, so I, I do apologize to everyone. I'm having some trouble with my connection here. Uh, we go. So, John, uh, please feel free to, to start. I think uh, Jonathan is struggling with his connection. Yes. Okay, thank you for the invitation. Um, I will say a few words uh, first about the um, EU 3D project. Uh, the, the basic purpose of the EU, project, EU 3D project is to examine those conditions under which differentiation is conducive to dominance and to examine those conditions under which differentiation is conducive to democracy. So this means that differentiation is not intrinsically good or bad, but it can take different forms and shapes. So this is the general understanding. We want to try to develop a sorting mechanism in order to understand the various manifestations of differentiation. And this means combining different theoretical approaches. So in a more diagnostic sense, we're trying 
uh, drawing quite a bit on institutionalism, broadly speaking, also historical uh, institutionalism, in terms of a um, the more prescriptive normative assessment of the democratic and dominance aspects, but drawing on normative theory, especially the uh, literature on non and a number of other people who have written on this. So, um, in this particular talk, I'm going to confine myself to try to say something about the current situation uh, as a kind of a diagnostic exercise. The particular um, vocabulary I'm using now is not necessarily key in the uh, EU 3D, but it is an illustration of some of the um, work we're doing to try to develop um, approaches and understandings of, of differentiation. So we start with a kind of a paradox um, in the Eurozone crisis or the um, crises uh, the, the, that the EU has gone through the last decade or so, that if you think about a differentiated EU, and I think Sandra pointed out this quite nicely about, and also Frank, about the diversity and also with structural pluralism. So a more differentiated uh, EU will be a more diverse EU. The, the condominium uh, notion covers this very, very nicely. Now, and, and I think you see, saw this also from Frank's speak, speech that differentiated integration is also very much about this type of diversity when it's not confined, limited in time, when it is really a reflection of a heterogeneity of preferences. Now, we can clearly see this in the EU's uh, post-crisis mutation. However, we also see that there was quite a, after the initial stages, there was quite a dogged determination to hold on to a particular approach. And there was a discussion whether this was ordo liberal or neoliberal. Um, that's not the, the critical issue, but there was a particular uh, approach to deal with the financial crisis that manifests itself quite strongly. And it's difficult to square that with a highly differentiated system, which is locally responsive. and um, and would be adapting to the various types of, of, of preferences out there because there was a diversity of views of how to deal with the crisis. But one particular approach came to dominate the, the perspective. And, and this therefore doesn't look like it is entirely compatible with this general understanding of differentiation. So the idea is to try to find a terminology that helps and use that as an intake to understand more about the basic structuring of the uh, European Union, drawing very much on institutionalism. So the term was then segmentation. And this, of course, is a term that you find broadly speaking, in all kinds of states. There's a large body of literature on this, across fields even. So, um, and the term segment is used quite widely. Also, we have to keep in mind the historical dimension about this, namely that as Tilly and other um, scholars were underlining, political, pre-modern political systems were often segmented. They were biased because they were only dealing with certain policy areas and they did not have the kind of modern understanding of, of sovereignty. That is that it controls the entire territory, but it rather focused much more on certain sectors, not like the standard international organizations we're thinking about today because they were political systems. However, they were complex and they were biased. So. So that's the starting point to, to try to carve out space within the debate on differentiation to say that the general understanding of differentiated EU is complex, it's open to variation and therefore difficult to govern and coordinate and we have seen that in the previous presentations. Whereas a segmented EU would be about selective closure. Certainly it would be uh, differentiated but it would be certain forms of closure and this is not only about structures and, and processes and rules, but it's also about mind frames. So the idea of segment combines a kind of a cognitive perspective, uh, people's mind frames, uh, and has also to do with political psych psychology about um, bounds, bounded rationality, but it brings that in much, much more clearly in this. Um, and also about patterns of learning path-dependent patterns of learning, stymied learning, uh, competency traps, and these elements of, of, of learning also that, that is limited and path-dependent. So that's basically the, the, the theoretical basis of this. Now, what is important to distinguish and, and 
to link it to the European Union is to dis to distinguish between a political order and segments. Segments are basically at the meso level in particular sectors, and we find this in most states. Whereas the claim about the EU is that after the crisis, it was developing towards becoming a segmented political order. So that we're talking about the constitutive features of the very element of the structure. And this sounds rather bizarre in a way, because when you think about segments, they cut across institutions and levels of governing. They're networks to some extent. So there must be, in that case, something about structure that locks this in. We have to capture this somehow. Um, what it also um, implies is that you can have variations. It doesn't mean that you have to pin a specific logic, austerity policy, or, or anything like this to a segment, but it can vary depending on closing of sectors under certain circumstances. But a system that has certain types of, of characteristics is much more prone to this type of closure or lock-in. This is basically the argument. So, so that's why a segmented political system or order is definitely differentiated, but it's distinctly differentiated. So, there, so certain segments become institutionally entrenched and shape the polities pattern of segmentation. And of course, the question, we, since this was uh, based on the analysis of of the um, crises, especially the financial crisis. The question now, of course, is, is COVID-19 about entrenching this form of segmentation or could it be about desegmentation? And I'll, I'll talk about this once we go into and understand, look a bit more closely at those features of the EU that we identify. So the first one is precisely this mind frames, cognitive closures, certain forms of, of understanding of problems and solutions that are biased, that are based on certain forms of expertise and certain worldviews and so on. So the suggestion is that during the, the crisis, there were two main, was the austerity policy with the um, with uh, uh, limits to, to spending and so forth, and also a securitization in the immigration field. It started out as a kind of a humanitarian response, but it became much more of a securitization. So this was a kind of mind frame that's carried by various actors in various types of institutions. The importance of, um, of security basically in a broad sense, not only um, uh, it, it's internal order as well and, and limiting uh, uh, immigration and a number of other things were, were linked to the idea of, of security. So this is more like securitization in the Copenhagen school uh, understanding of it. The second trait is that there is a particular policy style. And I think you find this at the European Union level that the EU has developed this particular policy style, which is limited so that it has a, re a limited repertoire of of measures because it is a regulatory order. So it doesn't have the fiscal means, for instance, uh, to balance this so that you get a certain, in that sense, a biased form of policy style that can lock in a kind of, of approach to, to how to deal with the problems. This again can be entrenched in the way in which the institutional configuration, again, this is a pattern of differentiation. And what, what I would emphasize in this is the way in which the EU is structured. And if you, if you go back to Fabrini's latest book, for instance, or several books on this, on the di distinction between the community and the union system, uh, you go also to uh, Fritz Schapp's work on, on the uh, lopsided character of the European Union in terms of market or negative integration versus market compensation with the voting rules and so forth, that this is a built-in bias. Together with that is also added Wolfgang Wessel's notion of fusion of levels. That is the embedding of member states in the institutional structure at the EU level. So it weaves the levels together and therefore you get a kind of a lock-in. So you get a very distinctive configuration of horizontal functional separation between the community system versus the union system uh, and with different levels of fusion across levels. So that in the community system, the member states are very deeply baked in and therefore there's little room for differentiation. Whereas there's much more in the union system in the core state powers. Um, so this has a certain 
bias, built-in bias on how the EU can deal with issues. And I would argue that this also stymies the ability to learn and, and makes that more path dependent in this sense. And it implicates national officials in EU level decision making. So, so this interweaving basically, and it's stronger in the community system than in the union system. Um, and then of course, this is amplified by the constraints on resources. So whatever biases there are, mean that they cannot actually spend themselves out of it. And even if the EU has circumvented many of the initial constraints built onto it, because the EU was initially set up as a segmented political system, but it was then trying to overcome much of this. However, with the crises, this process was kind of reversed again. And, and it is inst instructive to look at the way in which the EU had to circumvent the initial constraints on core state powers. And this is what Genschel and, and Jachtenfuchs and their contributors are underlining, namely that they are coordinating member states capacities, not developing own EU level capacity. So that there is this dependence, again, reinforcing the understanding of interweaving of levels. Um, so the, and, and that makes the EU also vulnerable on, on member state compliance in order to carry out the actions. So the, again, you can have patterns, uh, biases built into this. The vulnerability, external dependence and vulnerability also eats into this. We saw this in the financial crisis with the uh, uh, susceptibility to the uh, financial markets. We see this now in relation to both China uh, with the COVID and also with um, the uncertainties associated with the U US and of course also Russia coming in very much. So these are elements of vulnerability that also can, under certain circumstances, reinforce the EU's onus on acting. But if the EU is constrained, actions will also be path dependent and follow possibly also segmented logics. Finally, is that a segmented political order is lopsided because it has weaker desegmenting uh, arrangements. So the idea is that political, democratic political systems have a balance between segmentation because you want to harness the benefits of expertise and very often that's, that can be perfectly okay but when the desegmenting arrangements especially parliaments and so on are sidelined and cannot come with correctives cannot smoke out open up the closed rooms and smoke this out and provide alternative interpretations when when decisions are made in, in transparent sessions or sec, uh, places and so on it's much more difficult to uh, hold this accountable and to give a broader steer to it to correct these types of patterns. So the, the, the so the states therefore have a built-in balancing between harnessing expertise and participation, coming up with counter expertise and counter views and so on. And the EU in the crisis, uh, especially, was becoming biased uh, and less able to do so. So that basically is the idea. And now, now the question with the COVID is. To what extent um, can this change? With COVID, on the one hand, you see the, the um, recovery fund showing that th th this is certainly a strengthening capacity. The question is, is that going to be permanent? And what does it do to the EU's ability? At the same time, with the COVID, we have seen that parliaments necessarily have to be sidelined. This is a necessary element of dealing with crises. But it also means that it's going to be more difficult to get this type of balancing. So if the, the developments, again, are put on certain types of tracks, to what extent can you actually then correct it and put it back onto a different kind of track in this kind of a, of a circumstance. Um, so um, the last thing, of course, I have implied that there are democratic problems with this and therefore there could be elements of, of dominance. I think one has to be careful about this. I will certainly not equate segmentation with dominance. I think that's far too, too sharp and it, it's only under certain circumstances that these segments can close and have dominance effects, but it can lead to forms of exclusion. Um, it can lock in actors into certain uh, courses of action and therefore have negative patterns of distribution. It can undermine the scope for coordinated action and it can lead and generate informality, which is arbitrariness basically. Uh, so it can also have unintended effects. So there is, um, there is a case for discussing dominance in relation to such a type of development. But as again, one has to be careful and also define very specifically what one means by dominance.
Okay, thank you. For, uh, I should add that the, um, the talk I gave is based on, um, on a book that I uh, co-edited with Josef Batura towards a segmented European political order. Thank you very much. All right, so I believe that we have temporarily lost Jonathan, so I will take over in the meantime. Um, thank you very much, John. And I believe that the next step would be to give each of you the opportunity to react to each other, and each of you will have three minutes to do that. I suggest uh, perhaps uh, Frank, uh, in the same order as we did the presentations, would you like to go first? Okay, thank you. Um, so, I mean, it's, uh, it's not straightforward to uh, react to the other presentations because, as you've heard, uh, uh, these are quite different uh, takes on differentiated integration. Um, one uh, uh, issue uh, I should stress is, is, is the one that um, Sandra raised is, uh, is, of course, the question, yeah, how do you uh, how do you measure uh, and how do you define differentiated integration? So, uh, in in uh, uh, my presentation in our project, uh, uh, it is a it is a very legal definition yeah, where we look at um, um, the differential validity of EU treaty uh, um, articles and uh, EU legislative acts. Yeah, so. Um, a lot of what is differentiated in the EU um, is not uh, uh, really covered by this uh, legal definition or put, put differently. Um, we um, try to make the point yeah, that um, it's an informal coalition building with, within the EU, informal cooperation among groups of member states, non-compliance with a, a certain um, uh, EU legal act is not covered by what we call differentiated integration, but it is um, something uh, different. Also, uh, in uh, uh, contrast to what John Eric uh, uh, said, um, uh, my analysis did not try to be normative, um, uh, but try to explain the main uh, um, shapers and uh, drivers of uh, what we observe in in the domain of differentiated integration. And um, I think the, uh, the, the issue of uh, uh, domination that he raises, which is a real issue in uh, differentiated integration uh, from the intergovernmentalist point of view, really depends on, on, uh, um, on, on states' bargaining power yeah? and uh, uh, whether they can, they can shape the differentiated uh, arrangements according to their interests or not. So uh, again, in, in my analysis, um, richer states, richer member states, richer non-member states um, are not really dominated uh, by the uh, European Union because they uh, choose either to um, uh, selectively integrate with a certain arrangement or to opt out uh, using the bargaining power that they that they have, uh, whereas uh, domination is a real issue uh, in the EU's relations with uh, with uh, poorer states, either out, outside or in inside the European Union. Yeah, where uh, the European Union or a majority in the European Union has the bargaining power to ex to exclude and to discriminate against, and that's that's what we see in the context of accession negotiations. It's also what we see in the context of um, association relations with uh, non-member states. I mean, the, um, the one feature that mitigates this domination is a, is a, uh, 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 is a strong norm that when new uh, uh, countries join the European Union, uh, all kinds of differentiations uh, should in principle be temporary. Uh, and uh, so uh, it, this, uh, domination vis-a-vis -vis, uh, new member state tends to go away uh, after a, after a um, couple of years, seven, seven, ten years at most. So, so again, I mean, the European Union has, has inbuilt features uh, 
that, that limit uh, the domination of uh, member states. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here for the moment. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Sandra, would you like to react? Yeah, I think it would be interesting to, to react to, to questions, maybe. Uh, so I, I don't have much to say to, to Frank's presentation. I think it's very uh, parsimonious and, uh, and straightforward. So um, uh, we could think about the role of Germany as a rich uh, member state that still uh, wants more integration, right? Well, maybe you would say it has some uh, other deficits than uh, richness that leads it to want more integration. But okay, you certainly have an answer for that. Uh, I think, uh, Jan Eric, uh, this is extremely uh, yeah, uh, stimulating and different uh, take than, than uh, yeah, much of the literature. I think we have to bring the normative and substantive uh, elements uh, in our study of European integration. And I, I struggle with that when I look at EU asylum policies, for example. So thank you for uh, highlighting highlighting this. Um, I, I was wondering how much of what you said is inbuilt in the EU structure. Uh, and how much is linked to differentiated integration because it seemed to me that much of what you said is actually a critique of the EU and the dynamic it unfolds uh, more generally, this type of integration. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I, um, I, I, this was very... Um, I mean, I, I uh, appreciate these these interventions also, um, and I think that's um, useful because um, implicit in what I was talking is, of course, a, an attempt to sort of carve out space for the for the, some of the differences between the notion of differentiation and differentiated integration. I think Sandra was pre precisely pointing to that, because I was more focusing on the structure. So I was thinking more about the composition of the EU as a distinctly structured system in differentiation terms. So all political systems are differentiated, but the EU is dif distinctly differentiated. That's basically my, my point. So, and that's a comp complement. It's uh, to the idea of process more that differentiated integration is talking about. Although there are also, some people also talk about structure when they talk about differentiated integration. However, if you think, take it very seriously, or literally the, the term itself, it does imply an ongoing process more than it really looks at the consolidation or the or the constitutive features of a political system. So that's basically what, what I was trying to say. And and of course the idea that they distinct distinctly structured again has implications for how differentiated integration or maybe even disintegration proceeds. So that's basically the vantage point to look at the system itself. So it it is still also about differentiated integration, but it starts more from in terms of the, the system itself. On on dominance what I would like to add to Frank is, and this type of institutional perspective, I think, helps to, to, to shed light on that, is also the unintended effects of dominance. Because the EU is not intended to dominate. Uh, one can discuss that, all, of course, in relation to, to uh, enlargement, to what extent this is dominance in the sense that the EU uh, asserts its, um, its norms and rules on uh, enlargement. But it is a voluntary process of joining. And... Um, depending on where you start from, um, then the, yes, there is a certain imposition. Or that comes, then the question of course is how much of, of a leverage is there for, for negotiating and, and adapting norms and rules and so on. So I mean, one can discuss that. Um, it's also a very interesting theme in relation to closely affiliated non-members. And of course, all three of us are actually living in <laughs> closely affiliated non-members. So we're kind of looking at the EU from the outside. And again, this is a qu question of voluntary adherence. But of course, if you look at the, the, the relationship we have from an outside perspective, apply a normative perspective, it's about dominance. So it's a voluntary submission uh, to a system of dominance with limited elements of, of participation. But these states are also very capable of handling things. So the, the, the picture becomes more nuanced. And then one, one should start thinking more carefully about what one means with, with, with dominance in that sense and, and how to manage this. And I think the, di the different approaches here are, are, are fruitful in, in that sense too. But I just wanted to, to pitch in the, the idea that we need to be con concerned about the unintended effects of actions 
And that's, I think that's more of what we find in the EU than the uh, idea of dominance because the EU was explicitly set up to lock in states. So the, uh, and especially um, self-control and containment, like, like Germany, lock yourself in by rules and norms and so on to prevent it from dominating the others. I think this is the core of the, of the integration story of the EU. What I was trying to argue is that during the crisis and so on, there was an unintended effect of, of the responses to the, I think it is basically unintended because I don't think there was a deliberate attempt to dominate anyone, but the, but the configuration of forces were such that it had dominance of effects on people because Germany's role was so prominent, that it was a crisis, and also because there's a frailty and limitations in the EU structure itself that condition these types of actions. Okay, thanks. Thank you, John. Um, I'm not sure now whether Jonathan is still with us and whether he would like to take uh, over the Q&A session. I'm just gonna wait to see if he reacts. <laughs> Hi, Maria. Uh, I am back. All right. Sorry, but yeah, yeah. I am back. I was trying to follow uh, on my tablet but uh, I cannot see the Q&A. So um, Maria, if you would not mind um, fielding also the, the Q&A, and I just apologize to all uh, the audience for my connection problems. Sure, I'm happy to do it. All right, so thank you very much, uh, Sandra, Frank, and John. We have in the meantime received some interesting questions in uh, from from the audience and um, there is a, a couple of questions that can be grouped under the um, heading of um, the role of wealth in differentiated integration and this kind of uh, rich versus poor member states uh, power dynamics so there is for instance one question from um, from well perhaps I'll start with the question from Annette uh, Freiberg Inan uh, which uh, really at, at a very general level questions uh, the difference between um, intergovernmentalism as presented by Frank, so the question is mainly directed to Frank, um, and realist uh, international relations theory, uh, because it seems that your explanation of differentiated integration boils down to the strong get what they want, the weak accept as they must. And so um, the question then is, what is the added value of, or what is inno uh, innovative in intergovernmentalism as opposed to simply realist international relations theory applied to the EU? Frank, would you like to react to, to it now publicly in? Uh... Uh, yes, I can, I can do that. Uh, so, I mean, uh, of course, uh, intergovernmentalism has, uh, I mean, is a, is a theory of European integration, and as many theories of European integration has roots in IR theory, and uh, let's say the, uh, the overlap between intergovernmentalism and realism is uh, the focus on states as central actors, and uh, the focus on, on state power as, uh, as an important factor in uh, European integration. Reason. Of course, where it differs and where it's, I mean, if you speak in IR terms, where it's really closer to rationalist institutionalism or neoliberal institutionalism is uh, um, the focus on um, economic interdependence uh, rather than uh, security issues and military power, uh, the focus on issue specific bargaining power, uh, and the focus on institutions as uh, uh, solutions to cooperation problems. I mean, the focus on the economy, the focus on issue-specific bargaining power rather than military power, uh, and the focus on, uh, on, on, on uh, in institutions as commitment devices is really different from yours. Thank you. Um, a related question is uh, being asked by uh, Piero Tortola. 
who is then asking um, whether you could tell uh, the audience a bit more about uh, the empirical research that underpins your understanding of differentiated integration and again related to this claim that um, there is a difference between rich and poor countries in their willingness in driving forward integration because according to Piero that is uh, somewhat counterintuitive if you look for instance at uh, Eastern European member states who are uh, reluctant um, to integrate more in certain areas, for instance, Hungary uh, in the field of immigration. Yes, um, I mean, uh, uh, Piero is completely right. I mean, this, this was a very uh, rough sketch. Uh, so in the, in the time I had, I really uh, couldn't explain uh, the entire empirical analysis that we, that we did. So uh, basically what we did is uh, our unit of analysis are um, uh, we uh, look at uh, treaty negotiations and we try to explain uh, whether or not uh, specific countries um, get a differentiation in uh, specific uh, policy areas. And then we try to explain um, uh, the incidence of uh, differentiation by, by, a, by a number of factors. Yeah? So in, in our models, uh, wealth is of course not the only factors, uh, factor and the graphs I showed um, are the um, uh, are basically the marginal effects of wealth. So wealth doesn't explain everything about differentiated integration, of course, um, but it um, let's say it remains um, uh, uh, the most important factor, even if you control for national identities, for Eurosceptic governments, um, and uh, and a number of uh, other factors that we look at. Uh, um, um, and, and the other thing, of course, is that uh, it's about probabilities. Yeah. So uh, um, let's say being uh, let's say on the on the extreme uh, within the European Union when it comes to a country wealth gives you a higher probability uh, of uh, seeking and getting opt-outs, and let's say being being on the on the poorer end of the distribution among the uh, member states of the European Union gives you a, a significantly higher probability of being ex 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 excluded uh, uh, from integration upon uh, uh, joining the European Union. Um, we also find that, I, that national identities matter. Yeah? So uh, countries with, a, uh, with an exclusive national identity um, uh, also uh, uh, tend to have more opt-outs, but that only applies to treaty reforms, not in the accession periods. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, this heterogeneity of wealth, in our analysis, uh, based on the data that we have, is the, the single most important factor uh, uh, covering uh, different aspects of differentiated integration in the EU. Thank you, uh, Frank. I also have some questions for Sandra and I will um, perhaps group them and uh, then you can respond uh, to them together. So one question posed by um, someone who's, whose name I can, cannot clearly see, but uh, I believe the surname is Dimitrova, is asking, um, uh, to both actually Sandra and Frank about the influence of geopolitics and third countries on um, the EU's um, possibility for uh, domination. So for instance, Russia's influence on uh, the EU, or if you take the example of um, uh, Turkey and Tur Turkey's policy on or cooperation on migration, does it influence Frontex, the agency, Frontex operation, um, not in terms of legal, but in terms of informal control. So in other words, how do uh, geopolitics, um, um, yeah, how do you account for the influence of geopolitics on differentiated integration? And uh, another question for uh, Sandra coming from Alexander Schillen is, um, so thanks, thanking you for the interesting presentation and um, expressing that he was impressed by your explicit focus on the relationship between institutional structures and differentiated integration. And so the question then is um, whether in the context of your research, you also had the chance to look at um, into aspects of internal differentiated differentiation 
and to what extent this impacts governance processes within EU agencies. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I think the question of, of power and geopolitics uh, matters for all of, of our approaches, um, also in normative terms, in proposing counter frames, uh, anti liberal frames, and, and, and so on. Uh, but I, I would maybe distinguish, so for Antonetta's question, um, the effect of geopolitics on the coming into place of differentiated integration on the one hand <coughs> uh, and the functioning of, of differentiated integration on the other hand. Um, for, for the coming into place of differentiated integration, sure, um, foreign powers can exert a counter pull uh, also with externalities, uh, but, but also with, you know, um, pressure and, 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 and other means to, to try to uh, pull uh, countries to their direction and it works both internally and externally so we see member states which are being you know uh, lured by by foreign powers uh, and, and we see associated states uh, that that are divided on that so so certainly for the coming into function of differentiated integration it, it plays a role but also for the efficiency and, and per perhaps your, your question on Frontex and, and Turkey uh, is more about uh, the capacity of these um, enlarged uh, corporation uh, forms to, to perform their functions and, and their dependency on, on foreign actors. And here I would say uh, there is also, uh, in the case of, of Frontex in Turkey, uh, visible the need, uh, well, the, the externalities between between the two parties and and the uh, functional reasons for uh, Frontex to seek the collaboration of Turkey uh, and, and indeed the, the effects uh, that Turkey can have on, on the effectiveness. Um, this all regardless of the normative questions uh, that I leave out for the moment. Um, and the, the second question on the differentiated integration in agencies uh, for member states, um, I think uh, this is not so much a question of formal entitlements because formally uh, the member states have not differentiated um, uh, functions in, in EU regulatory agencies but of course there's, there's an in practice um, differences due to very much also regulatory capacity and expertise uh, and the extent to which uh, they take uh, the floor in, in these deliberations and try to, to shape uh, the contents of, of regulations. So it, it's maybe more a, a question of practice than for the internal differentiation within agencies than a question of formal entitlements. Thank you, Sandra. Um, now, I think we are, um, we are scheduled until 12, so we probably don't have a lot of time left, but I would like to group um, some questions that are still left in the Q&A and, and then let the, um, perhaps let the panelists choose which, which questions they would like to address in a, in a brief last round of, of comments and answers. So there are two questions which seem to um, want to push you, uh, all of you, a little bit more on uh, making a stance on your definitions and your both empirical and normative claims. There is uh, one question by participant uh, Yazid, um, who is asking, who is saying that um, the uh, critiques and explanations heard in this session do not help understand where differentiation uh, um, do not help understand differentiation, I assume that should be, uh, as long as the panelists approach differentiation as segmentation or condominium. The question is, do you see differentiation as a process or a form? And um, then there is another question by Jan Peter Bates who is interested in understanding um, um, your, so understanding your insights on the democratic legitimacy of differentiated integration. So for Frank and Sandra, the question would, for example, be, do your empirical theoretical perspectives and assessments point 
things towards normative criteria, um, how we could assess the desirability of differentiated integration. And for John, the question would be um, whether your analysis on domination uh, draws upon um, um, your earlier uh, 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 draws, draws upon earlier work on Taylor's concept of deep diversity. And another question for John um, that has been asked is um, again on domination. And the question is, uh, to what extent do you see the increasing political but also institutionalized organization of small member state coalitions like Visegrad or Hanseatic League, the Frugals, against further European integration in particular policy fields as an expression to, uh, of the will to prevent or oppose a Franco-German domination in the European Union? All right, so I'll, I'll leave you with those questions and perhaps um, um, each of you gets uh, a last round of, um, yeah, I guess the opportunity to, to make a last round of comments. Thanks. All right, why don't I ask John to go first? <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, I'll take the last question first. Um, Franco-German uh, domination. Well, I think this depends on how um, they foresee and, and and practice the European Union. If it is so that they move decisions towards the European Council in relatively close rooms and so on, and negotiate the deals uh, outside the treaties and so on, um, part of what happened during the crisis, then this could be an instance of domination through, um, through in lack of transparency. But if they, on the other hand, want to, uh, and, and work to reinforce the institutional setup of the EU and the levels of accountability, then they are locking themselves in. And this is not about uh, domination by them, because they themselves subject themselves to an EU set of rules and, and procedures. So then this then this doesn't count as domination. I think basically they are inclined towards the second. Um, they want to use the flexibility with the European Council and so forth in certain circumstances, but I think the general inclination and Macron's plans also have been to lock this in and as a kind of a self-bind. So I don't see this as an instance of Franco-German uh, domination. However, the, re the reverse on the Visegrad countries is precisely to undermine the demo especially Hungary and, and Poland, is to undermine the democratic norms and, and lines of accountability in the EU and therefore institute dominance precisely because their own citizens do not have a say in, in the proper working of the EU. So when the governments go to the council, they um, well, I mean, it's not, it's not only the democratic, it's basically the basic constitutional norms and rules that they have signed onto in the EU that these governments are not particularly concerned with upholding. And that in itself counts as an instance of domination, both in relation to the neighboring countries, because it's a breach of the agreement that they have signed, and also in relation to their own citizens, because um, they do not uphold the constitutional protective norms and they undermine the uh, freedom of speech and so forth. So this counts, so I, I would actually reverse the question and say that I think some of these, um, these uh, states are undermining this. Also the frugal four in terms of a uh, problem of solidarity, lack of solidarity at least, this is not exactly uh, domination, but it will be understood by, by um, the states most plagued by the uh, corona pandemic that also had gone through very significant uh, uh, euro crisis trans transformations and so on. This will, the lack of action by the European Union will be perceived as lack of recognition, basically. And that ties it into the other question about Taylor on, on recognition. So indeed, the domination aspect is, one is about the question of rights. And that, that, of course, comes to what Taylor also is talking about in terms of collective rights and the role for collective rights. And so that's one dimension. And the other one is, of course, the more subjective aspect of domination in terms of recognition. And this is a very difficult one to measure, but it, you certainly find this all over the place. So the domination is, a, is an interesting angle, but one also has to be careful about this because this is also about subjective evaluations. So Jan Peters, um, question about standards and so on is extremely important to to pin down what 
qualifies as domination. So on the one hand, you have the subjective accounts of the, of the actors, but you can't leave it at that. You also have to look at the institutional procedural democratic norms in place. And also again, have to also in the end come back with certain types of normative standards to, to uh, look at this. And of course, that's part of the process that we are, we are doing and uh, the work we're doing. Thank you. Um, thank you, John. I just saw that um, Jonathan had another question which um, he wanted to pose and because he was kind of cut, uh, cut off from our discussion, I think I will just throw it in and I'll add it to the other questions. Um, the question is, all of you, uh, or each of you, uh, have used a different uh, key concept. Uh, Frank, it is differentiated integration. For Sandra, it's differentiation. For John, it's segmentation. And the question Jonathan has is, are these three different ways of talking about this, are these three different ways of talking about the same thing? Or do you simply focus on different aspects of the European Union? All right, so uh, Sandra, would you like to, um, to uh, conclude with your um, last observations and comments? Yes, I, I will try to react to Jonathan's question and also the one on, on uh, democratic legitimacy. Uh, so maybe first on democratic legitimacy because I've had more time to think about that one. Um, I think um, Beth uh, asked the question. So uh, we do uh, in our um, theoretical framework uh, address also the question of how to study democratic legitimacy and um, the, the one uh, very prominent uh, aspect of that that I raised in this talk is the question of participation, right? How far are those which are subjected then to uh, these uh, rules uh, also participating in their development, even if only at this level of secondary EU institutions and we need to look at exactly what scope of influence they have there. So participation is, 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 is one criteria. Second criteria that I would also upheld is, uh, uphold is, is uh, effectiveness. How, what is the impact uh, of, of these uh, forms of differentiated integration on solving uh, problems of interdependence? Um, uh, so participation is one, impact is second. And the third is um, legitimation practices or democratic governance within uh, these fora. So transparency um, is important, but also possibilities for participation, consultation of civil society actors um, and accountability mechanisms. Is there a possibility to sanction or to um, criticize, to give feedback uh, to, to these bodies? Uh, and the first uh, aspect is, um, uh, well, I think there is a trade-off between the authority of, uh, of a decision-making body um, and its requirement for democratic legitimation. So the more authority, uh, the more binding and the more enforceable decisions are, the more of these other elements must be there. So the more participation must be given, the more uh, uh, also the legitimating practices, transparency, uh, consultations, accountability must be there. So these four criteria. Uh, and now to, to uh, Jonathan's question, whether we look at different things, um, I, I think that Frank's um, view on, on uh, intergovernmental uh, processes in bringing about differentiated integration um, is, is, sort, is, is, is looking at, at the um, uh, process of, of negotiating differentiated integration uh, between states, uh, whereas at least my approach is, is more looking at the structures within which then um, different units uh, interact, uh, not states, as, but it's more the practice then of, 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 of differentiation than, than the process by which it is constructed. It's more, it's functioning then. Uh, and and uh, John Eric, uh, I, 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 I'm intrigued myself by this notion of segmentation. Um, it, it, it seems to capture a lot. So maybe I would be uh, also uh, intrigued to, to hear you about where you position it. John, would you like to come back to that quickly? Absolutely. Um, well, 
uh, what I was saying, I said something about the relationship between differentiation and segmentation, because of course, segmentation is not about differentiation. The idea is that, is that um, within certain forms of, of differentiation, certain patterns of differentiation, segmentation can become a more systemic feature. But segmentation is a different process. Um, and it's, it's not the standard idea of, of differentiation because we normally think about differentiation in terms of institutions, procedures, and so forth. And segmentations are patterns of interaction often in between. So there's an also an interstitial element to the idea of, of segmentation that Joseph Bato is working a lot on. So it's a complement, uh, but it would be a subcategory insofar as, as we would discuss it in, in relation to differentiation. Um, it was both a process, but it's also what we're saying, it can be a defining feature of a, of a political system. Uh, and therefore, trying, squeeze, trying to squeeze as far as we can, the conditions, the, the structural institutional conditions or patterns of differentiation that could be conducive to segmentation. I think we push this as far as we can, can do it. Thank you. Frank? Yeah. Uh let me, uh, to, to conclude, just uh, come, come back to the question of democratic legitimacy, uh, and, and I, will, I will leave it at that. Now, that depends really on uh, where you come from normatively, what your starting point is. So if your starting point is uh, uh, Europe-wide democracy, if, you, uh, if, if, if the starting point is a Europe-wide demos, and uh, uh, the European Union as a as a unified polity, then of course um, differentiation is uh, democratically deficient because it does create unequal rights and obligations uh, among the citizens of the of the European Union. Um, so our starting point in in in, uh, in our project is a, is a is a different concept, which is democracy. Um, which uh, assumes um, that uh, the European Union is a, is a union of uh, polities, is, a, uh, um, uh, uh, is constituted by uh, different state peoples, different demoi, and uh, that each of these uh, state peoples, that uh, democratic legitimacy is, is basically anchored in these uh, uh, different uh, state peoples. So uh, in, in this perspective, uh, differentiated integration is highly compatible uh, with uh, democracy. And, and actually, if you take democracy seriously, uh, you will always end up having a, a differentially integrated European Union because these demoi um, have different uh, preferences uh, uh, with regard to the to the scope and depth of European integration and it is democratically legitimate and and, and even uh, it's an it's an uh, in, uh, it's, it is it is it is necessary uh, that uh, these individual demo have the final word of how much they would want to be integrated in the in the European Union so if you take democracy seriously uh, then um, differentiated integration is the institutional answer. I mean, the, again, I think the, the downside is when um, individual state peoples are dis discriminated against. Yeah? Uh, so the dominance comes in as, as long as, as um, I mean, uh, uh, John Eric has, has a rather, let's say, um, uh, optimistic view on this, uh, saying that it's basically all voluntary. As, as long as that is the case, there's no issue, yeah, but um, uh, when individual state people become dominated by whatever uh, 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 other uh, state people decide, uh, then that raises uh, uh, deficits of democratic legitimacy. Otherwise, uh, as long as we conceive of the EU as a democracy, uh, differentiated integration is is actually a rather more democratically legitimate system than a, a say, centralized, unified European democracy would be. Thank you, Frank. I think with this, I would like to close this section and to, um, to thank the participants um, for presenting very diverse and interesting ideas. We 
ran over time, but I think the richness of the discussion of concepts and ideas that have been presented today and also as they were asked about in the questions um, deserved or justifies that we ran over time. So thank you very much.